He was born with a purpose. A purpose that would change everything. He would prepare the way of the Lord. Again I say to you, the message. Repent to Israel, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The baptisms. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. I baptize you with water. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I. The imprisonment. His death. I must decrease so that he may increase. They called him John the Baptist. Join the Reverend Dr. Diamond Song this and every Wednesday night at 7.30 for the Bible study series entitled They Called Him John the Baptist on our YouTube page at Edgewater Baptist Church. On our YouTube page. Welcome to the online Bible study series of the Edgewater Waterford Circuit of Baptist Churches in St. Catherine, Jamaica. And as usual, a special welcome to those viewing from overseas. May we study God's word together as God speaks to our hearts. But before we do so, let us pray. Lord, we acknowledge our dependence upon you, especially when it comes on to the study of your word. We therefore now ask that you have your way in our lives as we seek not only to be hearers, but to be doers also. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Of course, those of you who have been studying with us this series entitled, They Call Him John the Baptist, we know that the last time we met in this capacity, we looked on part seven of our series. And in so doing, we focused on John the Baptist as the baptizer. John the Baptist as the baptizer. Coming from Matthew chapter three, verse one, and verse five through to verse 17. Now last time we said that depending on which version of the Bible you read, John may either be identified as John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. And we said that either way, both phrases affirm and confirm the fact that he was known more for the baptisms he conducted and for the sermons he preached or the lessons he taught. Indeed, we were saying that when you look on John the Baptist, it seemed as if much of the attention that was given to his ministry was centered on the baptisms that he had. And from the entire passage, the following are evident about these baptisms that were administered by John the Baptist. First of all, we noted last time their distinction. That indeed, John's baptisms were distinctly different from firstly, the baptism into Judaism. If you remember those of you who were with us last time, that we noted that those who were non-Jews, those who were Gentiles. One of the practices was that when they were converted to Judaism, they would get baptized by the Jews. And it seemed as though there are persons who confused John's baptism with that baptism into Judaism. But also, there's a distinct difference we said between the baptism of John or John's baptisms and the baptism in Christ Jesus. Matthew 3 verse 11, Acts chapter 19 verse 1 through to verse 5 confirmed and affirmed that there 
is a difference between the two. Still on the baptisms of John the Baptist, we not only noted their distinction, but secondly, their location. According to verse 5 and verse 6 of Matthew chapter 3, the baptisms took place at River Jordan. And we noted last time that River Jordan, according to Britannica.com, is more than 223 miles in length. It has always been a less than desirable place, though, for persons to go, much more to go into. For even today, even today, even in our world today, it's considered to be polluted. And yet still, the River Jordan remains one of the most visited sites in the Middle East. And last week we said that this is so perhaps for two main reasons. Firstly, its historic significance. As you know, Jordan River is mentioned on numerous occasions in the Old Testament with great significance. And also its symbolic significance. Jordan means to flow down. It's actually below sea level. And so when people got baptized in Jordan River, the symbolism of it was palpable. But the third thing we noted about John's baptisms were their prohibition. In, in verses 7 to 10 of Matthew chapter 3, we discovered that John prohibited mainly the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It says in verse 7 that when he saw them coming to his baptism, he said, Brood of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now you note carefully who John prohibited, of course, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the leaders of the religious institutions of the day and why he prohibited them because they did not show forth fruits worthy of repentance he was saying to them that you are coming because of a feeling an emotion it has not matriculated into lifestyle it has not shown that you have repented wholly and solely and he prohibited them from being baptized. Can you believe that? But fourth and final, we noted in terms of John's baptism, their inclusion. Because in verses 13 to 15, we see Jesus coming to be baptized. And initially, John the Baptist was saying, no, 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 I am to be baptized by you. But Jesus insisted. He insisted. And Jesus, Jesus, after the insistence, John the Baptist allowed him to come into Jordan's river. And John the Baptist ended up baptizing the Lord. He included him into the baptism. Now, the big question is, why would Jesus, Jesus who is perfect, sinless insist on being baptized with the baptism of repentance that John gave and the following are some possible and plausible reasons that were posited last week firstly we said that Jesus insisted because he wanted to identify with us in our sinfulness and unrighteousness. So the key point here is identification. He didn't have to be baptized, but to identify with us and our sinful state, Jesus went into that water to be baptized. Secondly, to exemplify for us the importance and significance of baptism. To exemplify for us, to show us in essence, 
the importance and the significance of this very important act in the Christian practice and Christian theology. Thirdly, Jesus insisted on being baptized by John the Baptist to affirm the public ministry of John the Baptist as authentic and authorized by God. And fourthly, to activate his own public ministry as consecrated and commissioned by God. And what we are saying is that in this one act of baptism, all of these four things were done. All of these four reasons were shown. Jesus knew what he was doing and he did it for a worthy cause. And of course, we ended our study last week with two questions that I want to commend those who responded and the interesting and insightful responses that were given. And so we segue into part eight of our series entitled, They Call Him John the Baptist. And in so doing, tonight, whatever time you are viewing or listening to this broadcast, we're looking on John the Baptist as forerunner. John the Baptist as forerunner. And we have two passages of scripture tonight. Isaiah 40, verse 1 through to verse 5. And Luke chapter 3, verse 2 to verse 6. That's Isaiah 40, 1 to 5, and Luke 3, verse 2 to verse 6. We begin with Isaiah 40, 1 to 5. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we go across to Luke chapter 3 verse 2 to verse 6. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled. And every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight. And the rough ways smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, although the word is not mentioned in the Bible in reference to John the Baptist, he was undoubtedly the forerunner of the Messiah. The gospel writers, especially Luke, definitely regarded him as such and therefore used the Isaiah 40 passage as what I would like to call the prophetic blueprint. The prophetic blueprint. It's as though... Luke went back into that Isaiah 40 passage and, and used it 
as point proof, as a blueprint, if you would, that the life and ministry and mission of John the Baptist shows that he was indeed the forerunner of Christ the Messiah. Now I must say that quite likely when some persons think of a forerunner, they have in mind the imagery of a runner who simply runs before everyone else in a race. Or they may regard a forerunner as the torch bearer who enters the Olympic Stadium ahead of the athletes. And of course, last month, many of us were glued to our television sets or our electronic devices to watch the races and the other activities that were part and parcel of the Olympics. And of course, you'd realize that a torch, the Olympic torch, was lit weeks, months before and passed through many countries until, and continents until they arrived in France. And then somebody carried the torch, ran with the torch into the stadium. Perhaps that's the imagery that some people have of a forerunner. However, I'd like for us to note that in Bible days, the forerunner was primarily associated with the practice of Eastern monarchs or kings or emperors. And whenever they embarked on an expedition, especially through unfrequented or inhospitable territories, they sent persons known as forerunners before them. And such forerunners had the following basic roles and responsibilities which will be the guiding points in our study tonight. Firstly, as their roles and responsibilities, they had the role and responsibility of leading the procession. Leading the procession. Now, as the leader of this royal procession, it was important that the forerunner bore in mind Two very important things. Firstly, that his role was crucial for the expedition. His role should not be taken lightly. It was extremely important. It was a crucial role for the expedition to be successful. In fact, when you read the history of this thing, if the forerunner or forerunners were not properly chosen and put in place, the king, the monarch, the emperor would not leave because it was important that the forerunner did what needed to be done before the emperor entered the pathway of that expedition. So too was the role and function of John the Baptist. His role was crucial for the expedition. Also, it's important that the forerunner bore in mind that he was not the center of attraction. He was not the center of attraction. Perhaps it could be a temptation for forerunners to believe that because they were the first persons that would have been seen, that they became the center of attraction because after all, they are the first. The point is, the center of attraction was the king, the monarch. In our context, Jesus Christ himself. We're going to be looking days to come on the book of John and John's perspective of how John the Baptist performed his role. And one of the things I can tell you to look out for is the fact that John the Baptist kept on pointing to Jesus. In chapter 1, for example, there are those who were saying, Are you the Christ? And he kept on saying, No, I'm not. He's saying there's one who's to come. And he was saying, He must increase, but I must decrease. 
in John's gospel, John the Baptist was always pointing to Christ because he knew that as forerunner, he, John the Baptist, was not the center of attraction. We all need to bear that in mind when we take on the ministry, take on the mission of the gospel in whatever form that we are not the centers of attraction. Jesus Christ is. He is the one to be glorified. He is the one to be exalted. And speaking about glory and glorification, our second point tonight in regards to the role and function of the forerunner, not only in terms of leading the procession, but watch this. His role was also the role of making the proclamation. Making the proclamation. What proclamation is that? It's found in Isaiah 40 verse 5. Where it says, The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. That's a part of the Isaiah 40 passage that we read at the start where the forerunner would declare, proclaim that the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. All flesh shall see it together. That was his main proclamation. The glory of the Lord being revealed. Now in Bible days, the forerunners were also town criers. And I'm sure many of you have heard and seen town criers at work. Many of them have these Horns that are placed on top of the vehicle or speakers in the vehicle pointed outwards. They pass through the community. And they, 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 they proclaim an event or an activity of importance. So we all can know what is about to happen. That, that's town crying and that's part of the role and function and responsibility of the forerunner. To proclaim. And according to Isaiah 40 verse 5 again, he's to proclaim in this case the glory of the Lord. And in this regard, at least two things are highlighted about this glory of the Lord. First of all, it's certainty. I'm sure you realize that verse 5 says the glory of the Lord shall, shall be revealed. That speaks of certainty. There's no if in and but in. There's no doubt there's no uncertainty. It shall be revealed. But this glory also speaks of universality. Because the second part of verse 5 says, All flesh shall see it. All flesh shall see it. And when we think of this glory, we understand that John the Baptist was being prepared. He was the forerunner of Christ's ministry on earth. The Lord is coming back again. And that's when the full glory of the Lord shall be revealed. That's why the songwriter speaks of that glory. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed to the ends of the earth. And all flesh shall see it. All flesh shall know what a day that shall be. What a day. So, the second role and responsibility of the forerunner is making the proclamation after leading the procession. But there's a final role and responsibility for the forerunner. And that is ensuring the preparation. Ensuring the preparation. In Luke chapter 3, verse 4 through to verse 5, it reads as follows. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill brought low. 
The crooked places shall be made straight. The rough ways smooth. Those verses are speaking of preparation. Prepare the way of the Lord. Now, in his commentary on the book of Isaiah, theologian by the name of Albert Barnes writes as follows, and I quote, To do this, that is, prepare the way for the monarch, the king, it was necessary for them, forerunners, to provide supplies and make bridges, or find fording places over the streams to level hills and construct causeways over valleys or fill them up and to make a way through the forest which might lie in their intended line of march. End of quote. Now I know that's a mouthful. That is a mouthful. But one of the things I think that Theologian Barnes wanted his readers to realize is that this preparation that was a role and responsibility of the forerunner was no fly-by-night activity. And I want us to know that there are two obvious things, two obvious things at least coming out of what Theologian Barnes has disclosed. First of all, the fact that such preparation was comprehensive. Please remember all of these places. It speaks of streams, hills, valleys, making a way to the wilderness. All of these things are pointing to the fact that as Jamaicans would say, every nook and cranny, every area, Every corner needs to be addressed along that pathway that the king will traverse. What it is saying in my mind is that when we are thinking and talking about preparing the way of the Lord, we need to be realizing that this is a comprehensive exercise. It's not just to be done partially or part way. Is to be done completely, comprehensively. Every aspect of our lives are important. Every nook and cranny of our lives are important socially, emotionally, financially, spiritually, morally, relationally. Every aspect of our lives are important in preparing the way of the Lord. And so when we think, I hope, next time of a forerunner, understand all those things that Mr. Barnes mentioned that the forerunner or forerunners had to do in preparing the way of the Lord. But also, I'm sure it realized that such preparation was not only comprehensive, but it was intensive. It's seriously hard work. It, 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 you had to dig in your heels into the ground. You, you had to get busy and do the work because faith without works is dead. Showing us, beloved, that when we think and talk about our responsibilities and roles as servants of God, preparing, being a part of preparing this world and our own lives for the second coming of the Lord. We have to work at it. We don't work to be saved, but we work because we are saved. And we do so to the glory of God. And so as we continue to explore this whole matter of John the Baptist and how God used him as forerunner, may he continue to challenge our very lives because a forerunner First of all, one who would be leading the procession. The forerunner, the one who is making the proclamation. The forerunner, 
is one who will be ensuring the preparation. Before we close tonight, I'd like to leave with us, as usual, two questions. Questions to consider over the next couple of days. Question number one. In what ways are we also forerunners of Christ? I believe that in my sharing with you earlier, you'd have picked up some of those ways. But the question remains, in what ways are we also forerunners of Christ? And then finally, what are some of the main challenges you have faced or will face in being a forerunner of Christ? Again, what are some of the main challenges you have faced or will face in being a forerunner of Christ? Those are some of the questions, two questions that I'd like to leave with us. And if you are willing to respond to those questions, if you have your own questions, if you have observations, comments, suggestions, will you please address them, write, email them to ebwbc bible studies at gmail.com. That's E B W B C B I B L E S T U D I E S at gmail.com. And of course, our prayer and counseling hotline numbers are 876-220-6474 and 876-332-7900. Five, six. Someone is there to pray with you, to counsel, and to share thoughts with you. And speaking about prayer, let us pray. Lord, we await your second coming. And we do so knowing that you have called us to also serve as forerunners of your second return. We ask, good Lord, that you would continually educate us, equip us, and energize us to do what you want us to do the way you want us to do it. So, keep us true, Lord Jesus. Keep us true. For there's a race that we must run and there's a victory to be won. Give us power. Every hour. Keep us true. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you desire prayer and counseling, please call our prayer and counseling hotline at 876-220-6474 or send a WhatsApp message to 876-332-7956. Remember to share, like, and subscribe to our YouTube page. Continue to pray for each other. Have a blessed week in the Lord.